I was born in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and raised all over the country because my father was in the Army and it was World War II. Prior to that, I moved quite a bit because it was also the Depression back then. And my father, who had been a civil engineer building US Highway 54 from Chicago to El Paso, was laid off the moment that project was finished. And my grandfather, maternal grandfather, who owned several thousand acres of ranch in the Tularosa Valley, which is where Alamogordo is, over by the White Sands, said, all right, Steve, and my father, Steve Byam, was from Pennsylvania, and he had done no ranching before. But my grandfather said, okay, Steve, if you can handle a ranch, there's a herd of wild Guernsey cattle on that ranch, and if you can do something with that and make a living, have at it. And so for two years, we were on the ranch, and my dad ran that as a dairy farm and uh, made a living. But once the price of dairy products went through the, went to the basement, he had to find something else to sustain his family. Anyway, my dad got a job in a place called Cienega, which is west of the Guadalupe Mountains in New Mexico and east of the Oregon Mountains and therefore east of the Tularosa Valley and the high, high plains where Tularosa Valley is. It's actually on a high uh, elevation. Cienega was a cleft in the earth about probably 30 miles long and about five or six miles wide. And a family had lived there since the 19th century and had earned their living by stealing cattle from Texas and driving it across the border into New Mexico where the Texas Rangers couldn't follow them. And then driving it up to Santa Fe or Albuquerque more likely and selling it there. But they were never caught because Cienega was 110 miles from any settlement at all. Very isolated, they could do as they pleased. And they had murdered several people. My mother, uh, as a high school student, was assigned from her civics class, assigned her to go and uh, report on a uh, trial, a murder trial that was going on in Alamogordo. And it was the Lewis, two Lewis brothers who were accused of murdering a sheep herder that they had hired who had disappeared. He was a young kid, probably 16 or so, and had, uh, he was literate, and so he had been writing home to his family, telling them that he would come home as soon as he got paid in the spring. And spring came, and suddenly all correspondence ceased, and the boy did not come home. And the parents then brought suit because they were sure that he had been killed in order not to have to pay him. But they couldn't find a body when they did the, when they examined the situation, uh, when the police examined it or the sheriff, couldn't find any body. So they got off uh, free. They were acquitted of the murder, murder charge and my mother knew very well and so did anyone else who happened to witness the trial knew that they were guilty. My mother taught elementary school and she had also gone to college. She had two years of college when she got married and that stopped her continuing for a while because she also got pregnant and had me and there was no way she was going back. Also, she couldn't afford it. Raising me was expensive and there was no, virtually no income for a few years there. And uh, her finishing her education had to be put off until I was grown and had gone off to school, uh, college myself. 
And then she did. She got a, a master's degree in uh, librarian. She was a librarianship. My father, late, much later, he was already a master of science in engineering, which was unusual in those days. You went into an engineering job with a, with a BS, usually a Bachelor of Science. My parents wanted me to be educated as they were and perhaps go further. When my mother was teaching school, she had two years of college and later finished her degree much later after I had grown and gone off to college myself. Her maiden name was Edgington and the Edgington family uh, produced six kids and all of them, every single one, went through college. And several of them continued with their uh, courses beyond that because they wanted to go into education themselves. My mother's uh, next oldest sister, Lucille, was, uh, was one of those who went on to take further courses in education. My uncle, Wiley was also an engineer and had taken, I think he was probably a master of science and education. So all the, the whole family was very eager to, to learn and to learn in a formal way through, uh, through education, college and university education. So yes, I was in a privileged situation because most people from Alamogordo did not go to college. They simply finished high school and went on with their lives that way. Oddly enough, during World War II, the women took over. They had, they had to, there were no men around, and so if you wanted to uh, build something, you had to be an engineer. Rosie the <laughs> and so many women found professions that they normally would not have access to during the war. But then when the men came home, that was back to, to status quo ante, uh, you, your job was taken away by a man, and that was that. He went back home and raised the kids and drove them to, uh, to soccer matches and, and that sort of thing. That was uh, your limit. But once the women's movement got started, then things began to open up. And uh, I was destined, destined myself to be a university professor, although it was still rare enough in those days. But I was determined and simply made my way, whether, whether it was popular or not. I think I was more interested in how I was going to make, make my career rather than in the movement itself because I had been a women's lib movement during my whole life, I think. I, I first remember realizing that women were second-class citizens when I was about six and I uh, wanted a cowboy suit we were still in Cienega at that point, and I was surrounded by ranchers and cowboys. And I wanted, I looked up cowboy suits in the Sears catalog. That was the Christmas catalog that used to come every year. And the cowboy suits were leather chaps and little leather vests with medallions and tassels and of course a shirt to go under it and a, t and a 10 gallon hat to suit the, uh, the little boy's cranium. And then I looked for female versions of this and the little girl suit was cheap. You could see cheap uh, even on the advertising page in the catalog. And I was furious. I remember throwing, throwing the catalog across the room and saying, I refuse to be dressed in anything as absurd as that. If I'm going to be a cowboy, I want chaps and uh, leather chaps and vests to go with it and a hat. And then I began to notice how women were being treated at the age of six. I think my, my parents were worried that I was too much too boyish.
because I, I refused to play with dolls. I played with building highways and with toy trucks and cars rather than with, with dolls and played rough games, climbed trees, did all the things that a uh, all did all the things that a um, little boy would normally be doing because I was in conscious revolt against everything. I was supposed to love little baby dolls. I was not interested in little baby dolls. Thank you very much. <laughs> and therefore I think the fact that I later on uh, couldn't have children didn't bother me very much because I had never had that ache for a baby, to, to hold a baby in my arms and all the rest of that, that women are supposed to necessarily want and are trained to want as little girls. I don't think the teachers noticed much because I was a high achiever. I read a lot of books, and could make book reports, and I was in debates, and I could do reading in libraries in order to have the background, in other words, research, to hold up my end of a debate, and so forth. And I was simply classed as a good student. And they didn't worry about my my revolt against the, the f female situation as uh, uh, my parents noticed that and my, my close relatives. And they sort of wrote it off as uh, I was a tomboy and I would certainly grow out of it. And I, I suppose I did because I fell in love and married and carried on a very happy married life for 43 years until my husband died and until death do, did us part. And that was, that was my fate, but I did not, was unable to have children. I might have been different had I had them. When I announced to my parents that I was uh, engaged to this man who was a professor and 20 years older than I was, I was 21 and he was 42. It was exactly 20 years older. And they had a fit because he was Jewish, older than me, European. How could he possibly know what to do with an American woman. I couldn't do it, and if he, was, he would not allow me to go to church, and on and on and on and on. And I convinced them that there was nothing they could do about it because I was 21, <laughs> and I could do as I pleased, which I then did, and married him in May of that first, first graduate year uh, after I had finished college. I was fascinated by the history of the Jesuits and how they had suffered because they started off being about 6,000 men and they ended up being about 500 who survived the arrest and exile. After I had finished writing the book, I needed a Jesuit to read it because I didn't know any Jesuits. I didn't know whether uh, the only Jesuit I knew was Pfefferkorn himself, having read his book. Right. And so I needed to find out whether I'd been accurate in portraying a Jesuit. And I uh, looked on the internet to see if there, see, I thought maybe a, a Jesuit professor, because Jesuits are running schools all over the country, high, uh, high schools and colleges. And the first thing that came up was, uh, uh, was in West Virginia. And that didn't work out. I, I was promised that a Jesuit would read it, and I waited a year for one to do that, and they didn't do it. Didn't get around to bothering her to read it. And then one day, I, here in San Antonio, I opened the yellow pages and, and I looked down and it said, Jesuit Fathers in tiny print. And I called the number 
And someone answered, a female answered, saying, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. And I said, Oh, I thought it was Jesuit Fathers. And she said, Well, it is. And I said, Well, I have a novel that I've been trying to find a Jesuit to read it and have been unsuccessful. Uh, could I, uh, is there a Jesuit there who might read it? And she said, uh, Oh, she said, that would be Father Jim. He's the one who reads. And I thought, <laughs> I thought what? The Jesuits have fallen upon us <laughs> bad times. <laughs> if there's only one who reads. And of course, it turns out that, that what she meant was, he's the one who reads fiction. The, the other Jesuit at the church at the time was a reader all right, but but he was not the one who would have been interested in reading a book by someone coming in from the outside like, like me. Anyway, she said, um, well, just a moment, I'll connect you. And she did, and this amazing voice came across the telephone, and I uh, was immediately attracted by the voice itself. It was, uh, it was harmonious and very masculine, and just it made you feel as if you were being comforted somehow by just the tone of voice. Anyway, he said, uh, bring the book in and we'll have a talk. And I went in and it turned out that he was almost exactly my age and had all the same references, cultural references that I have. Uh, he was from Florida, however, had grown up in Florida, and uh, so far, far from growing up the way I did, and and he and his twin, not twin, he and his younger brother, slightly younger, uh, both became Jesuit priests. But anyway, he said, leave the book with me. He said, I'm the pastor of Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, and uh, I'm, I'm a very busy person, so I may not get around to reading it. It would probably take me a couple of weeks. And I said, Father, take your time. I've been trying to get a priest to read this for over a year, so two weeks is nothing. Anyway, two days later, he called me and said, I couldn't put your book down. And there are a couple of little things wrong with the ranking of the Jesuits, but otherwise your Jesuits are behaving like Jesuits. As far as the personality and the, and the motives and all the rest of it, that's, that was what I was uncertain about. And he said, yeah, fine. Anyway, um, he wanted me to come back to discuss it, so I did. And then I asked him for a third meeting and I said, to him, I said, uh, Father, uh, it's time to convert me. And this is the big change because I had been uh, more or less a lapsed Presbyterian. That was my background. And uh, I had gone to a Presbyterian undergraduate college and my mother was Presbyterian and I had gone to church with her and uh, my husband never stopped me from going to church if I felt like it, but I was pretty, pretty lax. But I was always interested in theology, so it was not a matter of a disbelief or anything, it was just plain old indifference, I guess. Although, when once my husband died, I began looking for a church home. I suddenly felt a need for uh, for that kind of support. I was in deep, deep grief over losing my husband. And uh, uh, still, I still am, but the, the really deep, piercing grief lasted uh, for, for two or three years afterwards. And I was still crying and in private over it, weeping. Uh, and I just, uh, Somehow the Presbyterian Church wasn't doing it for me, so I began looking at Catholic churches, even back then, and going to these masses up here in these big Catholic churches up here on, in North San Antonio, wealthy, wealthy big churches. And I, somehow I just didn't feel that they needed me, or they were just too posh. And 
when I went down to Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. This is in the poorest district in San Antonio, serving the poorest people, Mexican people, and I know Spanish, so I knew I could, uh, could do something down there. And I liked the church itself, the atmosphere, when I went in to uh, look at the church and sit there for a little while and feel the atmosphere, I liked it. I felt at home. And so the, uh, the third meeting with Father Jim, James Lambert is his name, uh, I said, Father, uh, it's time for you to convert me. And he said, he said, quote, you have to be kidding. And I said, no, Father, I'm not kidding. And so he went upstairs and got this enormous book, which is simply called Catholicism, and handed it to me. It's a thousand-page book, and said, read this. And if you're still interested, we'll see about that. And I already had done enough theological studies that I, everything in the book was familiar to me. So. I said, I read it and I'm ready. And so I'm converted as of the, uh, 2001. And so as a final thought, I would say, live your life the best you know how. Make your choices the, the right choice, even if it's an uncomfortable choice, because somehow you will be able to live with yourself and believe in yourself if you do something that you know is wrong and you're ashamed of yourself, uh, that will not work. You have to be true to, your, to yourself and to your moral sense. The philosopher Kant said that you have an innate moral sense, and I believe that to be true also. Live according to that, and I have always been an optimist. Believe that things are going to work out in one way or another on the positive side and live believing that and they will. Mine have done so most of the time. Of course I've had all the, the losses and the grief that people have to go through lo losing loved ones and uh, lost my be very beloved father when I was 22 and uh, fortunately I was married so I had a support uh, in that grief and then I lost the husband, but I was a mature human being by that time and, uh, and could handle grief a little better. But anyway, despite that sort of thing happening, which are, is inevitable in every, everyone's life, uh, I believed in living according to your conscience and believing that the good will come out of your choices.